Hi everyone and welcome to this lecture for chapter 17. So with chapter 17, we begin uh, our final unit, which is unit five. Um, and unit five will cover chapter 17, 18, and 19. And this unit is all about nutrition through the life cycle. Um, so we'll go from actually even like planning to have a baby. So even prior to conception, we'll kind of start there in the life cycle and we'll go all the way through, you know, aging and death. Um, so chapter 17 covers like pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, um, and up through the first year of life. So <clears throat> this is a pretty lengthy chapter. Uh, so I will break up this lecture into two recordings. Um, okay, so just a little, a little bit about prior to even conceiving. And so this, this word conception or conceiving, maybe you are familiar with, it, it literally means the point at which the ovum or the egg is fertilized by the sperm. So it's that, that point at which you know, the, the two reproductive cells from the male and from the female join and can go on to create an embryo and ultimately a fetus and ultimately you know, a newborn baby. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about the importance of nutrition in, in this time leading up to conception. Because at the time that the egg and the sperm meet, if the egg and the sperm have come from um, undernourished bodies, then that's already going to set up the developing embryo to be deficient in certain nutrients and potentially subject to uh, physical or, and later on, potentially even mental or cognitive uh, growth delays or malformations. So adequate nutrition um, from conception through the first year of life is very essential for tissue formation, neurological development, certainly bone growth, bone modeling, and bone remodeling, as we've talked about. Um, and again, also essential for achieving peak physical and intellectual potential in adult life. So actually what the male and female have done in the time leading up to producing the, the egg and the sperm that meet to form the, form the embryo is really, really critical, what they've done in terms of <laughs> caring for their nutritional health and physical health. Um, really impacts the the infant, the child, the adult that that comes from that um, conception. Um, so as, as we've said here, certainly this can whatever's going on preconception for the for the male and the female with regard to nutritional health and physical health can affect the developing embryo and fetus and ultimately infant and adult later on. Um, one of the most important things, one of the reasons why this is critically important too, is because a lot of the nutrition related problems that might develop during pregnancy for the developing embryo or fetus typically happen um, in the first few weeks. And so again, this is why in first few weeks of pregnancy. So again, this is why um, having adequate nutrition and healthy physical activity prior to even conceiving is, is so important. So typically before the mother is even pregnant, um, these nutrition related problems can already be, like the foundation can already be set to, to cause again, either physical or mental abnormalities in the developing embryo or fetus. <clears throat> so I think maybe one of the most well-known examples, I guess, is neural tube defects. Um, like an example of that is spina bifida, which which results from low folate status in the female body um, at the time of uh, conception. Uh, and so neural tube defects, there's a there's a few different ways this can happen, but it's effectively a, all of them are effectively a failure of the closing of the spinal cord. Um, so we'll see an example of that later on. And again, this is caused by inadequate folate status in the the person who becomes pregnant during the first few weeks after conception. And so if, you know, if a person conceives, if they, if they happen to know the day that they've conceived and they know on that day, you know, which is really rare, I guess, which is why I'm sort of saying that it's, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's super rare that somebody would actually know that. Um, you know, if you did know that, then you could go and go to the doctor and say, okay, how, am I, how is my folate status? How is my B12? How is my iron? And you could have it all checked out. But 
in real world, what happens is a lot of times a person doesn't know that they've become pregnant at the moment of conception. They might not know for a few weeks later, and it is literally in those few weeks that a nutrient deficiency can affect the developing embryo in the first few weeks of embryonic development. Um, so anyway, maybe I've said this enough times in enough different ways. So it's just really, really important uh, for both the male and the female to check in and, and honestly spend a few months managing their nutritional health and their physical health um, prior to even trying to conceive. Um, so adequate folate status, this is 400 micrograms per day is, is the recommendation for any healthy adult. Um, so prior to conception, there's not an increased need for folate, just a need to have adequate um, status in the body you know, at the time that conception happens. And therefore you're, you can really, really significantly reduce any risk of any of these, uh, again, physical or cognitive um, developmental delays or ab literally developmental abnormalities that might occur. Um, and again, also in this, in this period of um, embryonic development, so really these first few weeks after conception, this is where the, the developing organism, the developing human, um, is most susceptible to the effect of teratogens. And so teratogens, the definition is in the parentheses here, basically anything that comes into the, the pregnant body, into that female body, that might um, affect the embryo and cause malformation. So um, typically when we talk about teratogens, we're talking about alcohol in any of its form, uh, tobacco, and that can be firsthand or secondhand exposure, and then any sort of illicit or illegal drugs. So all of these can cause birth defects, <clears throat> and I didn't write it here <laughs> again, but the teratogens affect the developing embryo in those first few weeks after conception. So again, really important to, uh, if, if two people want to you know, produce a really healthy offspring, really, really wise to spend you know, a month, a couple months, several months prior to even trying to conceive um, and really making sure they're taking excellent care of their bodies, reducing their exposure to these teratogens, um, and making sure that they don't have any nutritional deficiencies. So again, prior to conception, it's really important to adopt a healthy lifestyle, talk with a physician, um, you know, get some blood tests, make sure your uh, nutrient status is, is good across um, all different nutrients. At the end of this um, first lecture, we'll look at, I think there's seven or so, seven or eight key micronutrients that um, we really want to make sure we have enough of, or a, a, you know, a person who intends to become pregnant really wants to make sure efficient in these nutrients prior to um, conception. But the simplest thing to do is just check all micronutrients across the board. Um, with the physician, you might also talk about how much caffeine you're taking in and whether or not that's a safe amount for the developing uh, embryo or fetus. And then uh, also any medications that might affect the embryonic or fetal development and any herbs or supplements. So just have a good, you know, total lifestyle chat uh, and make sure that everything you, and this is for both people, both the male and the female, make sure that everything you're doing is um, safe and healthy for the baby. And of course, a good one to do would be to stop smoking and if possible, you know, uh, completely uh, reduce to zero and the exposure to secondhand smoke as well. So a healthy diet and appropriate level of physical activity before conception. So anything that promotes a healthful body weight. Um, what we see is that uh, a female who's, whose BMI does fit roughly within that um, healthy range, but you'll notice this is not exactly that healthy BMI range. This is uh, slightly higher. So the healthy BMI range is about 18.9 to 24.9. So this is actually in that healthy rate, weight range, but not close to the underweight range and even dipping over a little bit into the overweight range. So um, what we've seen is that a person who becomes pregnant who's in this BMI range written on this page has the best chance for really healthful pregnancy and delivery with fewest complications. Um, 
And then of course, you know, having a healthy diet and staying physically active before and during the pregnancy is going to lower the risk for any other negative outcomes, such as a really long labor, a C-section, gestational diabetes, and hypertension. Uh, and then a male, sorry, again, I haven't changed all of these words just yet, but a, a male's nutrition before conception is also important, as I've said. Um, certainly sperm number and the motility of the sperm, so the ability of the sperm to move well and travel all the way, you know, uh, through the vaginal canal, through the uterus, into the fallopian tube, um, that's really important that the sperm can be that um, healthy and agile. So sperm, total sperm count and the healthfulness of the sperm can be reduced which is not a good thing, right? Can be reduced by alcohol intake, certain prescription medications and illegal drugs. Again, tobacco, cigarette smoking, e-cigarettes, um, again, an un, certainly an unhealthy diet and also stress. Uh, same for the female too, would um, even just the full, like the reproductive organs uh, in the female body might, and the hormonal cycles in the female body can be thrown off. Um, by excessive stress. So really important for both the male and the female to um, you know, do some, do some good work to make sure they're healthy prior to conception. And lastly, adequate nutrition certainly keeps the immune system strong and again, promotes fertility. All right, <clears throat> so now during pregnancy, um, I, of course a balanced and nourishing diet throughout the pregnancy is still critical. Of course, at this point during the pregnancy, uh, nourishing diet and physical activity are gonna support the fetal growth and development. It also helps keep the pregnant person healthy and safe throughout the pregnancy. Um, and of course, a healthy diet with physical activity is also gonna reduce the risk of overconsumption of calories, which is the other form of malnutrition. Um, do be familiar with this term gestation. It's, it's just sort of the more scientific way of saying pregnancy. So if you see it on a test, you know, know what that means. It's a pretty simple. I don't want you to get any questions wrong because you couldn't recall what gestation meant. So gestation um, is just referring to pregnancy. So a full term gestation or full term pregnancy is typically at least 38 weeks and in many cases even close to 42 weeks. Um, and we we kind of, I guess, <laughs> talk about gestation in three trimesters um, based on the type of development that's going on um, and the types of changes that happen throughout the basically nine months of gestation. So we, we say that there are, there are three trimesters, first, second, and third, and each trimester lasts, you know, roughly three months, 13 to 14 weeks. Some other terms to know, so zygote, this is the single fertilized cell. So when the um, when that egg and the sperm meet and, and, and the egg actually becomes fertilized, uh, then we have a zygote. And then as the zygote starts to multiply and replicate, um, that, that first, those first stages of replication and growth, um, we call that an embryo. Uh, and so that's for about three to eight weeks after fertilization, so after conception, uh, we're gonna call that developing organism the, an embryo. And then um, there are some significant changes that happen after about the eighth week, um, and the growth really starts to pick up at this point. So from week nine all the way to birth or delivery, we now call this developing organism a fetus. Um, and then here are some pictures or uh, diagrams, I guess, to help um, understand all this. So this is figure 17.1 showing ovulation, conception, and implantation of the zygote in the, uterine, in the wall of the uterus. So step one is ovulation, right? Uh, an egg or an ovum is released from the ovary. And in this class, we certainly won't go through the development of the a mature egg. Um, so for our purposes, <laughs> we'll just know that a mature egg gets released from the ovary, um, hopefully will make its way into the fallopian tube. Um, and so it's here actually in the fallopian tube or the uterine tube that the sperm would meet the egg and fertilize the egg. 
Um, so again, the sperm has had to travel all this way. Again, this is the uterus, and you'd have the vaginal canal here. The sperm would have had to travel all this way through the full uterus, through the fallopian tube, and practically all the way, practically to the terminus of the fallopian tube. So again, that's why sperm motility is so important um, to the healthfulness of the developing um, embryo and fetus, and ultimately to the health of the infant, child, adult. Um, so again, that's why male nutrition is equally as important to female nutrition prior to conception. Um, okay, so assuming one of these sperm actually meets with the egg and fertilize it, now we have a single-celled organism called a zygote, right? And then the zygote, which is the fertilized ovum, really starts to rapidly divide, even while it's traveling along the fallopian tube. Um, and so there is a point at which we, we call the zygote a blastocyst, which is basically a, a more developed zygote. It's no longer a single-celled um, organism. It's now, you know, hundreds of cells or so. And so the blastocyst is the thing that's actually going to arrive in the uterus and implant in the uterine lining. And then again, as that um, cell division continues, the blastocyst eventually becomes what we call the embryo. So in the first trimester, some of this is what we just looked at on that previous page. So the, the zygote is gonna travel through the fallopian tube, that blastocyst will implant on the wall of the uterus, and we're gonna see some development certainly of that embryo. We're gonna see organs and little like buds of limbs, facial features, and even the placenta are all going to develop during this first trimester, so the, the first 13 or 14 weeks after conception. And again, the, the first part of the first trimester, oftentimes uh, a, a, pr a pregnant person might not even know that they're pregnant until maybe midway through the first trimester. Um, so all this development might occur um, without the person even knowing they're pregnant. So during the first few weeks, um, again, the embryo is going to get all of its nutrients actually from the lining of the uterus, the cells lining the uterus. And it's not really until the fourth week that the placenta has developed. Um, and I'll show you a picture coming up of the, of the placenta kind of tucked inside the uterine wall. Um, and I think a lot of folks are familiar with the placenta, once it forms, becomes the um, basically an organ that starts to provide the nutrients to the developing embryo and ultimately the fetus and also removing waste products from the developing organism as well. Um, yeah, so the placenta isn't typically fully formed and fully functional until we get into the second trimester, but it definitely begins forming here in the first trimester. And then I think we're also, most people are probably familiar with the umbilical cord, which is literally just a cord of blood vessels that come into um, the fetus, so they connect the placenta to the fetus, right? And the placenta also back to the uh, maternal um, blood vessels. Um, again, as we said, it's in this first trimester that the embryo is vulnerable to teratogens, which can again cause physical and mental um, uh, abnormalities, basically. Uh, so we do call this the critical period. Technically, the first the whole first trimester is considered the critical period because the embryo is so vulnerable um, to things that could cause it harm at this point. And if there is, um, you know, maybe excessive or enough, really, it doesn't even have to be that excessive. But if there's enough exposure to teratogens, uh, it's not uncommon to see spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. And then by the third month, which would be the end of the first trimester, we now call the developing organism a fetus. So this is just a visual representation of what's going on in that first trimester. And again, we're, we're referring to the developing organism here as an embryo um, for the most part. So again, this would be like a cross section of the uterus. So you see all the tissue of the uterus, and then you see inside the uterus. Here you've got the embryo starting to develop, and it's that, I highlighted the whole thing, but it's that little piece right there. Um, 
just two weeks later, by five weeks post-conception, again, you're starting to see limb buds, you're starting to see bones develop, you're, the skeleton, you're starting to see organs develop, um, and we're starting to see uh, the placenta developing as well here. And then by eight to 10 weeks, um, at this point, we can call it a, we can call the developing organism a fetus. You see the placenta is has grown quite significantly from week five, um, and you can see the umbilical cord pretty clearly too. Uh, and then this this is this the schematic I mentioned before, just showing the placenta development. Uh, so here's the uterine wall, right? This first section to the left, and then this section. You can see the blood vessels connecting to each other, but this sort of middle section is the placenta, and you can see the umbilical cord connecting the placenta to the developing fetus. And then here, is, here would just be the interior, um, the interior of the uterus. So I think a lot of us are familiar with the blue and red, and if, if this is your first science class, you know, the blue and red are representing um, veins and arteries. So again, the placenta doesn't only bring nutrients to the developing fetus, it also carries wastes out of the developing fetus, so they can be metabolized or disposed of by the uh, by the mother, I guess, or the pregnant person. <laughs> My cat is sitting next to me, and he's snoring loudly enough <laughs> so that I can hear him. Okay, so into the second trimester. Um, in the second trimester, we have definitely continued growth and maturation of the fetus. We do start to see pretty significant like growth in length. So about um, the fetus will grow to be about three inches at, from three inches. So what? And sorry, entering the second trimester, the fetus is about three inches long, and by the end of the second trimester, it may be over a foot long by the end. Um, some Babies are born prematurely, and um, some are born very prematurely. They may even be born at the end of the second trimester. Um, in this case, because they're they're so premature, meaning they have not, they are still missing three months of development that would have otherwise occurred inside of the uterus. Oftentimes, these babies do need intensive neonatal care. Neonatal simply meaning neo. Hopefully, you remember neo meaning new and natal just meaning birth, so a newborn, so intensive newborn care. Um, and then in the third trimester, again, still pretty intense growth and maturation. Um, the fetus gains about uh, half to three quarters of its total weight at this point, so significant weight gain of the fetus. Obviously, that's gonna reflect in significant weight gain for the um, pregnant person. The brain grows quite a lot here in the third trimester, and then the, some of the organs really kind of mature quite a bit too. So the lungs become more fully mature so that when the baby comes out, it can actually breathe air. And then of course, a balanced and adequate diet continues to be critical for the pregnant person. Um, I don't think I'm gonna go over this, there's nothing per se in here that we need to know over this class, but if you're interested just in the timeline of the embryonic and fetal development, um, certainly pause here and take a look. The, otherwise, if you have the fifth edition, this is figure 17.4 from the text, um, but it just shows you all the different um, development that goes on in the first trimester, the second trimester, and then the third trimester. Uh, sorry, I, I highlighted that wrong. Did I? No, that's correct, yeah. So those, those, the three different colors you can see are kind of the first, second, and third trimester. So kind of fun, interesting to look at to see how the, um, ultimately the developing human is, is forming in there. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about both what happens at delivery. So we can have uh, infants born who are underweight. We can also have infants born who are overweight. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about both. Uh, so low birth weight infants, right? Basically meaning that their birth weight is lower than we would expect a healthy baby to be. So this number five and a half pounds is about what we expect for a healthy um, infant when they're born. So low birth weight is anything below five and a half pounds. 
Um, typically, a low birth weight infant is going to be born from an undernourished mother, right? And hopefully, that makes sense. If the if the pregnant person wasn't able to get adequate nutrition, then there likely wasn't enough going to the placenta and to the fetus to really help this uh, fetus develop fully. So they're likely to come out underweight. Um, this also sets the infant up for increased risk for infections, learning disabilities, again, impaired or slowed physical development, and also increases the risk for death in that first year of life. And we talked briefly about this concept of babies being born early. Um, so a preterm baby is the, is the, I guess, the term or the name given to any baby that's actually born before the full uh, gestation, right? So we said the full gestation lasts at least 38, even up to 42 weeks. So any baby being born before 38 weeks is considered preterm. Um, and then there's also this term, small for gestational age. So a small for gestational age baby is a full-term baby, but weighs less than would be expected for their age. Uh, again, figure 17.5 from your book. So this is just showing the, the infant on the right is a two-day-old healthy infant born at a healthy weight. And the two on the left are two low birth weight infants. So you can see pretty clear differences already in just their physical growth. And then on the other side, we have high birth weight babies. So um, babies that are born you know, heavier than we would expect them to be at a higher weight than we would expect them to be. So typically this comes about from um, the pregnant person ha having gained excessive amounts of weight during the pregnancy or even going into pregnancy um, being, you know, on that high end of the overweight or even in the obese range for the BMI scale. Um, so certainly being overweight prior to becoming pregnant or having excessive weight gain during the pregnancy increases the risk for a high birth weight uh, infant. And the issues here are more so, again, I guess as we ex would expect, just the opposite end of the spectrum there. So increased risk for trauma during birth um, and certainly increased risk for the need for delivery via cesarean section or C-section. Um, we have the same kind of an opposite term here, large for gestational age. So infants who are born at full term, um, but are larger than we would expect for their age in, in terms of weight. So this puts um, the infant at a greater risk for, again, early death in that, you know, shortly after delivery or even in that first year of life. Um, and this is especially true if the mom or if the pregnant person also had diabetes uh, throughout the pregnancy. So then infants who are born to overweight or obese mothers tend to have higher rates of obesity themselves throughout childhood and adolescence, and typically that also predicts uh, obesity in adulthood. Um, and not just obesity, but also metabolic abnormalities. So this would put the person at a greater risk for um, issues like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, um, uh, unhealthy cholesterol levels, et cetera. So again, I'll just thumb back here. Hopefully it makes sense right, if a, a low for birth weight baby or a small for gestational age, um, they didn't have enough nutrition, right? So there's gonna be impaired development, both physically and cognitively, definitely increased risk for death. And on the other end, high for birth weight baby, um, less risk of death per se, um, but more risk of trauma during delivery. Um, and again, much more likely to be obese during childhood and throughout the rest of the lifespan, and therefore at greater risk for metabolic disorders. So what would be a healthy pattern of weight gain for the pregnant person? Um, typically it's suggested that over the course of the nine months, a pregnant person should gain about 25 to 35 pounds, and that would be considered healthy. Um, so much weight gain is of course risky. We just talked about issues of too much weight gain on this page. Um, 
and the pattern of weight gain is also really important. So this is why uh, I didn't write it out here, but 25 to 35 pounds over the course of nine months is a healthy weight gain, not 25 pounds of weight gained in the first trimester, but you know, slow, steady weight gain throughout the course of the pregnancy that, that follows along with the healthy weight gain of the developing fetus. Um, so in the first trimester, about three to five pounds, so not a significant amount of weight gain in those first three months. And then in the second and third trimester, so in the remaining six months, the healthy weight gain is nice, slow, and steady, about one pound per week. Um, it is not recommended to try to lose weight during pregnancy, even if a person is overweight. Um, what's recommended is that, that an overweight person just simply shouldn't really gain too much additional weight. So if someone is already overweight beginning pregnancy, then we would actually, a healthy pregnancy would be to not even gain 25 pounds, but to gain slightly less. So not trying to lose weight, but slowing the um, weight gain, the additional weight gain that would come from pregnancy. Um, and the reason for this, again, is because we don't want to risk undernourishing the fetus. So again, with weight loss, right? With weight loss, we, we have to actually literally consume fewer nutrients. And so when we're consuming fewer nutrients, obviously that sets the, the creates a risk for depriving the fetus of those nutrients. Um, and then again, a birth weight of five and a half pounds of the infant is considered a successful pregnancy. Um, yeah, so this is this is a nice chart, I think. So pre-pregnancy weight status, so whether, and this is based on BMI scale, but um, if you're in that healthy weight range in that 18.5 to 24.9, right, you'd want to gain that 25, 35 pounds over the nine months. Um, underweight, this is important, you would want to gain slightly more than that, right? So even up, potentially up to 40 pounds, because anybody going into pregnancy underweight is going to uh, put the developing fetus at risk of being undernourished. And then you can see overweight and obese, um, significantly less weight gain is, is recommended during the pregnancy. Um, so what happens with that weight that's being gained? Obviously, uh, uh, quite a bit of it is going to go to the fetal development. Um, another good bit is going to go to maternal fat development. And most of that is helping to protect the developing fetus cushion the fetus and also to help protect the female's body and cushion the female body uh, throughout this developing period. And then you can see all the other things. So of course the placenta is gonna be, carry some of that weight, uh, the uterus itself. There's gonna be significantly increased blood flow. Um, and then there's gonna be amniotic fluid and extracellular fluids increasing in, in total amount. And then of course, especially towards the end of the gestation period, the developing breast tissue so that the pregnant person can um, produce breast milk and feed the infant. So nutrition during pregnancy. Um, I think a really important thing to note is that the requirement for nearly all nutrients increases during pregnancy. Um, continue to follow you know, the, the healthy guidelines that we've talked about so far. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how macronutrient and micronutrient and fluid needs uh, change. So during pregnancy, um, again, with that weight gain of 25 to 35 pounds, well, that doesn't just manifest out of thin air. It has to come from eating more, um, but eating just enough more, right? Not too much. So um, remember we said in the first trimester, there might only be about five pounds gained. So really it's in the second and third trimesters that total caloric consumption increases. So it's suggested about 350 to 400 additional calories per day. You know, that's about a, you know, one additional small meal or a, few, a couple healthy snacks added throughout the day. Of course, the emphasis is still to consume nutrient-dense foods. This isn't like, um, you know, free reign to eat all the Big Macs and Whoppers and you know, dairy queen that, that a person wants to, this is arguably one of the most important times to really maximize your intake of healthful food so that you can give the developing, so that the person can give the developing fetus, you know, the best chance of having a healthy life themselves. 
Um, and then again, engage in moderate physical activity for sure. Um, always check with your physician first or have the person always check with their physician um, and just make sure that you know regular moderate intensity physical activity is indeed safe for that individual. And then as far as the macronutrients go, um, we'll see on the next page, fat intake actually roughly stays the same, but it's really protein intake uh, and carbohydrate intake that increases. And hopefully that makes sense now that you understand what protein and carbohydrates do in the body, right? Carbohydrates are our primary energy substrate. There's a super increase in energy demand during pregnancy. Um, and of course, there's a heightened need for protein too, because as, as you know, proteins are a major structural component of the body. And so as we're developing, as the pregnant person is developing this fetus, there's a, a greatly increased need for more protein to actually develop the structure and the function of that body. So 1.1 grams per kilogram, right, that's up from 0 0.8. And 175 minimum grams of carbohydrate is up from the 130 minimum of the RDA. Um, as I just briefly mentioned, fat is going to be the same. So you don't necessarily need to consume more fat <laughs> during pregnancy. Um, of course, the same recommendations apply. Limit saturated fats and avoid trans fats. Um, fat is important because it's going to help the uh, newborn regulate body temperature. So certainly some of the fat that the pregnant person is consuming is going to go to the uh, developing fetus. And then within the category of fats, intake of omega-3 fatty acids is really, 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 really important. Um, so our omega-3 fatty acids, especially the DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, is critical for the neurological development as well as development of the eyes. Um, so you might remember we talked about um, flax seeds and chia seeds and walnuts being a great uh, plant source of omega-3 fatty acids, and then fish as well containing docosahexaenoic acid. We'll see towards the end of the lecture, also we want to be mindful of mercury intake. So consuming too much fish is not recommended during pregnancy. So this would be a great time to get some of those omega-3s from your plant foods. And then the micronutrients. So I think I estimated there were seven or eight, but there are nine, <laughs> uh, 10 actually. So there are 10, macro that's easy, 10 uh, micronutrients, excuse me, that are super critical during pregnancy. Of course, there are all of the micronutrients that we've talked about so far are critical during pregnancy, but the 10 listed here are maybe the most critical. And um, I believe eight of these have an increase, uh, sorry, seven of these, that's where I had seven. Seven of these have an increased um, RDA uh, during pregnancy. So here are the seven. Got it right. <laughs> Here are the seven that have an increased RDA during pregnancy. So folate, B12, vitamins C and A, iron, zinc, and iodine. And so pre-pregnancy, right, this is the RDA for any healthy adult. And then you can see pregnancy is the next column over. And you can see quite simply all of these have an increased um, recommendation, recommended intake. And then the right just shows you the percentage increase. So folate and iron are the two, and iodine roughly, are the two that increase the most. So we'll go through each one. Um, some of this hopefully is review for you, which is always helpful. Um, but of course, we're, this time we're looking at it from the context of uh, fetal development. So uh, folate is required for that cell division. That's why it's so important in the first trimester and so important that a pregnant person um, conceives already at a healthy folate status. Because as soon as that sperm fertilizes the egg, as soon as that zygote forms and starts replicating, that's cell division for which folate is necessary. Um, so folate is really critical for the development of the neural tube, uh, which is the, what will ultimately become the brain and spinal cord. Um, and so deficiency of folate during that first trimester can result in spina bifida and anencephaly, which are two types of neural tube defects. Deficiency is also associated with macrocytic anemia. You might remember that 
from our conversation on the B vitamins. Um, and right, anemia meaning low, literally the word means no blood or lack of blood. So what happens, you might recall in anemia is that the blood cells, the red blood cells that form are kind of malformed and don't function properly. So that's why we can say it's a lack of blood because it's literally a lack of functional red blood cells. Uh, and then again, uh, again, the RDA is 400 micrograms per day for any healthy adult and uh, increases to 600 per day during pregnancy. This is a look at spina bifida. So um, I'm gonna look at B first, but this would be your spinal column, right? Here's the, all the different vertebrae, so the spinal column developing. And here's the spinal cord, basically where your nervous system is. And in um, spina bifida, what happens is the cord doesn't like close fully. And so this sort of extrusion of the spinal cord material forms at the low back. Um, and that, that is spina bifida. So that's caused by a deficiency of folate. B12. Um, so B12 is really important to actually regenerate folate. Um, yeah, and also supports in that cell development. So this is another important one that's imp that <laughs> this is another one that's important even pre-conception. Um, the RDA goes up a little bit. And in fact, what's kind of cool, I think, is that absorption, the, the pregnant body will actually absorb more during pregnancy. So efficiency improves. Um, remember B12 is kind of a complicated one. It's, it's a vitamin that's made by bacteria. So depending on um, how an animal is raised, if they're exposed to healthful bacteria, quite literally, if they're exposed to like a field <laughs> with healthy soil, uh, they're likely to get exposed to B12. And so they're likely to have some B12 in their flesh when they're slaughtered. Um, so there's likely to be some B12 in their flesh if you eat the animal's meat. Um, but this day and age, we're pretty fortunate, I would say, because we now know the extreme importance of B12. So uh, for people who choose not to eat meat, there are lots of ways to get B12 now. Um, always just check the Nutrition Facts panel um, in the ingredients list, and you can see if a food has been fortified with B12. Many different types of foods are at this point. Um, a lot, of, a lot of milks, whether it's cow's milk or whether it's a plant-based milk, are fortified with B12. Um, you can also take a, a B12 supplement. Um, and there's also something called nutritional yeast, which is a common like cheese substitute for people who don't eat cheese. Uh, and that's, that typically has a lot of B12 in it. So B12 status is, of course, important for all people. Um, it tends to be that somebody following a vegan or vegetarian diet might be at a higher risk for B12 deficiency. So regardless of what diet you choose, make sure your B12 uh, status is adequate. Um, and if you need to, you know, look for supplementation or fortified foods. Then vitamin C, you might remember, is important not just for our immune system, but also for collagen synthesis. So this, we find collagen in various types of connective tissue. Uh, so, of course, that's really important for a developing organism. Um, well, let's see. So, we'll see a decreased, decreased concentration in the blood of the pregnant person. Um, and that's simply because blood volume increases. So, that means total concentration of vitamin C in the blood will decrease. And, of course, the vitamin gets transferred to the fetus through the placenta and the umbilical cord. So definitely important to increase the intake of vitamin C. Uh, the RDA goes up to 85 milligrams per day. Um, and remember, we saw this with any healthy adult. If, if, they're, if a person is smoking cigarettes as an adult, their baseline vitamin C requirement goes up. Um, and then if we have a deficiency of vitamin C, what we can see are preterm births, so born too soon or born before complete gestation and of course, complications with birth uh, and uh, growth and development. Vitamin A, um, so increased needs by about 10% during pregnancy. 
A deficiency of vitamin A increases the risk for low birth weight, also increases the risk for growth problems, and again, preterm delivery. Um, excess preformed vitamin A, so again, this would be like vitamin A in a supplement form, can actually act as a teratogen through the fetus. So it, there's enough vitamin A, I would say, in our food supply, so really important to just consume vitamin A, consume foods that are rich in vitamin A and beta carotene. And then iron, of course, really important, right? You, you know that iron is important for um, ox carrying oxygen in our red blood cells, so the hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, the need for iron increases greatly during the third trimester. Um, and this is because actually the fetus will start to store iron in the liver. So this is store, this is the fetus, <laughs> it's not written, sorry, but it's the fetus that stores iron in their developing liver and they start to store the iron in the third trimester. Um, and then they're gonna use that iron during the first few months of their infant life. Uh, so that's, that's why the iron need, especially in the third trimester increases. Um, of course, iron deficiency can result in iron deficiency anemia, and that's more so for the pregnant person because the fetus is actually gonna <laughs> take what it needs. Um, and so if there's not enough iron for both the pregnant person and the developing fetus, the fetus is actually gonna be the one that gets more, um, more iron. Uh, so then the, the pregnant person becomes at risk for iron deficiency anemia. If there's, like totally not enough iron to go around such that both the fetus and the pregnant person are deficient, that's gonna increase the rate, the risk of low birth weight, preterm birth, stillbirth, and death. Um, remember we find iron in both um, animal flesh and in plants. Um, and then there are also some foods that are fortified with iron now too. Remember that vitamin C also enhances uh, the non-heme iron absorption. And the RDA for iron goes up a bit, so it's 27 milligrams per day. And then zinc, zinc also had a pretty, um, pretty strong increase. So this is really important for, remember we talked about the zinc fingers, I don't know if it's on this slide, um, but really important for DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. So of course that's gonna be really important. Um, if there's a risk of, sorry, if there's a deficiency of zinc, there's gonna be a significant risk for malformations, like physical malformations of the fetus. Again, premature birth, again, low birth size, um, and potentially extended labor. Um, absorption of zinc from supplements might be inhibited by high intakes of non-heme iron, which are found in iron supplements. So, do just be cautious. Um, and also, again, always it's recommended always throughout the pregnancy, of course, to be checking in with your primary care provider to make sure that your body status is healthy of all these different micronutrients. Um, and then again, zinc, pretty easy to get from shell, uh, shellfish, also from some red meats. Um, and of course, a lot of foods are fortified with zinc now too. And there are some plant foods as well that you can get small amounts of zinc from. And then iodine, I think this is the last one that has an increased um, RDA during pregnancy. Uh, and this is one of the ones that increases quite a bit. So increases to 220 micrograms per day. And this can be obtained from iodized sea salt. I think we also talked about um, like seaweed can also be a, a source of iodine. Um, so you can sprinkle a little bit of iodized salt on your food if you, if you choose that route. Um, and then typically a healthy and balanced diet would provide all the iodine needed during pregnancy. But again, as always, it's really important to just check body status and make sure there's enough in the body. You might remember we talked about cretinism as being um, kind of a, a developmental disorder, both for physical growth and mental growth. And so it's the leading cause of mental retardation in infants and children, and that's caused by iodine deficiency during pregnancy. 
And then these next three are just also critical, but there's not an increased need for any of these micronutrients during pregnancy. So vitamin D, um, remember that vitamin D kind of acts a little bit like a hormone, really important in helping get calcium into the developing bones, um, also supports healthy immune system. So again, vitamin D, you might recall, is our sunlight vitamin. So depending on the time of year of the pregnancy and the geographic location where the person lives, and also the pigmentation in the, in the pregnant person's skin, uh, there, you might be able to get enough vitamin D from sun exposure, but you might also need to supplement with vitamin D. So again, consider all those factors that we discussed about vitamin D. And if, if a person does decide to supplement with vitamin D, again, be careful because um, over supplementation can also be um, dangerous, just like we saw with vitamin A, and it can cause developmental disabilities uh, in the developing fetus and infant if taken in excess. And then calcium. Um, so this is an important note. The RDA, um, these are just your standard RDAs, but if it's a if it's a teenage person who becomes pregnant, the RDA during the for calcium during the teen years is greater than the RDA for adults. So the RDA for calcium is going to depend on the life stage of the pregnant person. Um, remember, calcium, of course, is super important for bone development as well as muscle function, um, um, neurological development. So that's why it's important, but the need isn't going to increase substantially during pregnancy anyways. Um, <clears throat> again, we're going to see an increased or like a more efficient absorption of calcium during pregnancy. Um, and if anyone is lactose intolerant, of course, there are lots of, we saw there's lots of plant foods that are good sources of calcium, and there are now lots of foods that are fortified with calcium. And then sodium. So the RDA, um, really important to keep it at 1500 megs per day and not exceed. Um, but remember, sodium is really important for fluid balance. So if there's too much sodium in the body, it can lead to fluid retention, bloating, and high blood pressure. And we're going to talk about some of the complications of high blood pressure during pregnancy. Um, but of course, sodium is important because total body fluids are going to increase during pregnancy. And so sodium being one of our major electrolytes, we definitely want to see a slight increase. Oh, sorry, we want to maintain <laughs> the sodium intake, but it's important to maintain sodium intake so that concentrations of sodium in body fluids remain at that healthy homeostatic level. Uh, and then just a little note on supplements. So supplementing during pregnancy and before pregnancy is not necessary. It kind of depends on the person and depends on their willingness to you know, really do careful and intense dietary planning to make sure they're meeting all their needs. So a lot of doctors do recommend prenatal supplements and a supplement during the pregnancy almost as a safeguard. Um, so that's it's certainly fine and certainly safe to do, but it's a, it's a uh, kind of a choice. Um, and then this last bullet here is really, really important. If a person chooses to supplement or take, you know, a prenatal uh, multivitamin or a, a multivitamin supplement throughout pregnancy, it is really, really important that, the, that it is considered a supplement. So a supplement means it's something in addition to, it's not replacing or taking the place of a healthful diet. So if someone supplements, if someone uses a prenatal, they should also already be following a very healthy, nutrient-rich diet. And then the fluid needs during pregnancy. So these definitely do increase. You might recall the basic um, water intake recommendation for females was 2.7 liters. So it increases a bit to three liters. Um, but I, I make this note here, this is considered adequate intake for the pregnant person. So certainly, you know, depending on climate, depending on physical activity level, um, the person may want to take in more than three liters of fluids per day. Of course, this is important because total body fluids increase during pregnancy. The fluids help with temperature regulation. 
Um, like we said, we're going to see increased amniotic fluid, which is the fluid that's protecting and cushioning the fetus. We're seeing increased blood volume. Um, also, having adequate fluid is important to reduce constipation and dehydration um, and can also prevent urinary tract infections. Okay, so then we'll go through a few of the um, like complications that we might see during pregnancy that are related to nutrition. So there's something called morning sickness, which sometimes is also referred to as NVP or nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. And so morning sickness is typically characterized by that feeling of nauseousness and, and vomiting. So this is something that can occur kind of any time, any day. It might last a full day. Um, as far as there being no cure, I think, uh, I guess I'm always of the mind that it's worth trying to investigate maybe what's causing it, but sometimes it's literally just because there's a new organism developing in that person's body. Um, but nonetheless, there are some things that can be done to at least attempt to reduce the symptoms. Um, so certainly I think an important one is consumption of fluids between meals. And then also maybe just decreasing the size of meals and eating, um, eating slightly more frequently. Also, maybe some cold foods might be helpful, just like cold, smooth foods might feel um, soothing. And then many women or pregnant people may also want to engage in some um, nice alternative therapies too, whether it's acupuncture, acupressure, biofeedback, and certainly meditation to reduce stress. Cravings and aversions. So um, cravings oftentimes are going to be for a specific type of food. A lot of times it's sweet or salty. Um, there is little evidence to date that a craving is indicating a deficiency of a nutrient. It, it may just be that that's what the person wants. Um, there's a specific type of craving called pika, and this is a craving for non-food things like wanting to chew on something like chalk or clay or sometimes ice cubes. Um, so that's a specific type of craving. And of course, food aversion is not wanting certain foods. And so some of the food aversions may, may be influenced by their own person's belief systems or their familial belief systems. But certainly food cravings and aversions are not uncommon. Uh, I would say they're not necessarily a big deal either. You know, if you you can have a small amount of whatever it is you're craving. And as long as the aversion isn't causing any sort of significant nutrient deficiency, that's fine too. And typically these things just last during the pregnancy and then they'll dissipate. Um, GERD and heartburn are not uncommon. So gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Um, so this happens, um, this is certainly not uncommon. And so there's a, good kind of physical and physiologic explanation for that. Um, so when a person becomes pregnant, the increase in hormones actually relaxes um, the lower, the smooth muscles at the bottom end of that esophagus. You remember the esophagus is that big pipe that goes from the back of the mouth all the way down kind of through the upper torso to the stomach. Um, and then, so then coming up from the other side, the uterus is expanding and might push up on the stomach. So you've got kind of like a relaxed lower esophagus and then you've got the stomach being pushed up from the bottom. So it's not too uncommon that um, a pregnant person might experience a little bit of that heartburn sensation, which is you know, where the heart is, is right behind it is where your um, esophagus meets the stomach. And so um, we call it heartburn because that's kind of like the location in the body where it burns literally or there's that sort of acidic type pain um, but that's from potentially food moving back up into the lower esophagus from the stomach. Um, excessive weight gain can also contribute to increased uh, sensation of GERD or heartburn so certainly making sure to keep weight gain um, in that healthy range would help to reduce GERD. Some other things that can be done to reduce GERD or heartburn again eating small frequent meals also making sure to chew food thoroughly. This is a good thing to do for anybody, anytime. Um, make sure to chew food thoroughly before swallowing. 
Also, I think a really important one is to wait just as one hour, I would say even two hours before laying down after eating, depends on the size of the meal as well. Um, if somebody has to lay down uh, shortly after eating, maybe lay like in a reclined chair so that your torso is still somewhat elevated um, or prop some pillows up behind the torso so that you know all of that full length of the esophagus into the stomach. So right about to the you know middle of your rib cage, uh, the torso is still ed elevated to help um, so that gravity can assist in pulling things down. So there's less chance of food moving back up. Constipation, also not uncommon, again, as that uterus expands and pushes on the digestive organs. Um, again, also we see the increased hormones during pregnancy causing the muscles of the intestines, particularly the large intestine, to relax. And in order to have healthy bowel movements, we actually need them to contract. <laughs> So constipation is not uncommon as well. Um, so some things that we can do here, uh, adequate intake of fiber would be critical then. And the, the need for fiber does not go up per se, but certainly meeting the minimum fiber intake would help a lot with constipation. Again, staying active um, and drinking enough fluids. All things that we know to help with constipation to begin with. And then gestational diabetes. So remember, um, gestation is pregnancy. So this is diabetes that occurs during pregnancy. Um, so this can happen either due to insufficient production of insulin or an insulin resistance that may come about during pregnancy. Um, the same suggestions that we've made for type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes apply. So eat a healthful diet, reduce intake of processed and refined sugars or processed and refined carbohydrates, Really choose complex carbohydrates, choose whole grains, choose, choose legumes, choose fruits and vegetables, and really minimize intake of what I call flour-based foods. Anything made from flour is basically a refined processed carbohydrate food. Um, be sure to moderate fat intake, so check and make sure that fat intake is not exceeding, you know, I'd say 25 or 30 percent of total caloric intake. Certainly reduce saturated fats. Sorry, that should have a D, saturated fats. Maintain good amounts of physical activity. Um, just moderate intensity is great. Maintain proper hydration, get good sleep. Um, and then of course, always the last resort is medication. Um, so gestational diabetes is risky for a few reasons. Um, certainly it can lead to uh, delivering a large for birth weight baby. Um, and it increases the risk of that baby developing type 2 diabetes later in life, as well as risk of being overweight later in life. Um, and the pregnant person, so the person delivering the baby is also at risk for um, development of type 2 diabetes post um, delivery, post birth. So the risk for gestational diabetes uh, can be increased by a pregnant person who is overweight or obese. Um, pregnancies over the age of 25, I think, interestingly, um, having a family history of type 2 diabetes, certainly some racial and ethnic minority groups are at an increased risk for type 2 diabetes, having a previous um, birth that was a large for gestational age, and also having polycystic ovarian syndrome, all of these things may increase the risk for gestational diabetes. Um, and then hypertensive disorders. So we mentioned on the previous slide that inadequate intake of fluids or excessive sodium intake can lead to um, high blood pressure during pregnancy. So gestational hypertension is, again, hypertension or high blood pressure that develops during um, pregnancy. Gestational hypertension unto itself is not necessarily a problem um, and would likely go away after delivery. Um, there is a type of hypertension, gestational hypertension, that is that is more dangerous. So that's what preeclampsia is. Preeclampsia is a sudden increase in blood pressure in the pregnant person, coupled with excessive and rapid weight gain that appears to be unrelated to food intake. Um, we would also see swelling and inflammation and likely protein in the urine too. Um, 
So preeclampsia is dangerous because it can become fatal if it's untreated. And the fatality can comes about comes about from from basically kidney failure. And eclampsia is that the term given to kidney failure. So seeing protein in the urine is a really uh, important warning sign um, of this because it's showing that the kidneys are not functioning properly. Uh, so there's an increased risk for development of preeclampsia in anyone who is overweight or obese coming into the pregnancy, anyone who smokes, a family history of hypertension, um, non-Hispanic black people are at a greater uh, risk for preeclampsia, anyone with diabetes during pregnancy, and then interestingly, younger pregnancies, so pregnancies during adolescence and older pregnancies, so pregnancies over 35 years old, um, first pregnancies, and then also deficiencies in vitamin C, vitamin E, calcium, and magnesium can lead to preeclampsia. So the treatment for preeclampsia, um, really the best thing is childbirth. I mean, if it's early on in the pregnancy, obviously you wouldn't induce the childbirth. Um, but depending on how far into the gestation it is, maybe there would be a kind of an earlier C-section. Um, but otherwise, bed rest is recommended, certainly medical oversight. And physical activity um, can also be helpful as a treatment too. Just you know, starting with some light physical activity uh, just to try to help bring that blood pressure down. Um, and then foodborne illness. So this is definitely really important during pregnancy. Um, we talked a lot about foodborne illness in the last unit, uh, but basically important to understand that during pregnancy, the, the pregnant person's immune system changes a little bit and becomes more vulnerable, um, more susceptible to infectious diseases. And then of course the developing fetus hardly has much of an immune system. So if some sort of virus or bacteria does affect the pregnant person, the developing fetus is gonna be at a high risk for also um, getting that same infection. Uh, so one of the more common bacterial infections that is uh, dangerous in pregnancy is infection by Listeria monocytogenes, which is a type of bacteria. And this bacteria can cause an infection called listeriosis. Um, so in most severe cases, listeriosis can trigger miscarriage or premature birth. Um, again, pregnant people have a 10 to 17 fold increased risk for um, contracting listeriosis. So the ways to avoid um, contact with listeria monocytogenes are mostly to avoid a lot of raw and undercooked um, meats and cheeses, basically. So avoiding raw and unpasteurized milks or soft cheeses. So some examples would be brie and feta, queso blanco, queso fresco, camembert. And then also avoiding a lot of um, like smoked meats, refrigerated meats like cold cuts or deli meats avoiding raw or, or undercooked eggs, avoiding raw or undercooked meat, poultry, fish, um, and then unpasteurized juices and raw like bean sprouts that you might see on a salad. So again, you'll see a lot of that is from raw or undercooked meat, fish, and eggs uh, and dairy. I think this is a repeat. <laughs> this says the same thing here. Um, this is also the, uh, I think this is the only spot where this shows up is um, exposure to mercury. So again, reducing intake of large fish during pregnancy is important to reduce exposure to um, mercury. So that's like shark or swordfish, um, albacore tuna, mackerel, um, even salmon. I would recommend decreasing intake of salmon during pregnancy. Um, and of course, if you're going to cook it, make sure you cook it thoroughly. Uh, and so of course, as we talked about in, in the last unit, I guess in chapter 15, really important overall to just revisit those safe food handling practices, make keep hot foods cold and cold foods, sorry, <laughs> keep cold foods, cold foods cold and hot foods hot um, and sanitize your surfaces in between, um, you know, cooking with raw or prepping raw fish or cheese or eggs. Um, and then also make sure you've cooked your meat to the appropriate temperature. Uh, this is just a little infographic. So the listeria monocytogenes 
Uh, you'll find it again in raw or undercooked or unpasteurized meat, seafood, and soft cheeses. And then the one like vegetable source would be sprouts. So that should be pretty easy to reduce during pregnancy. Um, and then lastly, some other considerations during pregnancy. So we'll go through each of these. So adolescent pregnancy, we've said a little bit about this already. Um, remember, an adolescent person is, all, is still developing themselves. So their bones are still developing, um, uh, many of their muscles and I mean, their organs are mostly developed, but they're still growing, right? So they still have a lot of, uh, an adolescent person already has increased nutrient needs themselves. Um, so higher needs for calories and bone related nutrients, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. Um, and it's much easier to see inadequate weight gain during pregnancy if it's an adolescent pregnancy because there's such an increased need for calories then. Um, it's also more common to see poor prenatal care, so higher rates of prenatal alcohol and drug use. And of course, not surprisingly, that would lead to higher rates of preterm birth, low birth weight babies and other um, complications during pregnancy or at birth. Uh, and then we don't talk about it so much here, but certainly uh, somebody over the age of 35 trying to get pregnant, there are also some risks associated with that as well, some of which we've mentioned on previous slides. And then just a word about, again, anybody who is practicing, you know, or following vegetarian or vegan diet, um, uh, just some of the same things to look out for, but these things might be a little bit harder to get from plant sources. So again, really careful planning to make sure you're getting enough of these nutrients. Uh, so D, B6, B12, calcium, iron, zinc, and then DHA, your omega-3. Um, so supplements might be really worth considering. Um, again, always check with your healthcare provider and make sure your body stores are adequate. Exercise, so a really important one. <laughs> it is definitely important, if possible, for the pregnant person to maintain physical activity throughout the pregnancy as much as they can. Um, so all of the good things we know about exercise, they're true in pregnancy too. So it helps maintain the pregnant person's physical health, helps improve their mood, um, helps that person probably feel more in control of their body as it's changing with this developing fetus. Certainly reduces risk for gestational diabetes, certainly reduces risk for preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, can also help to lower back pain, and it can shorten the duration of active labor. So many, many benefits for exercise. I think this is also a helpful chart, um, just giving an example of how a person might stay active throughout the week. Um, you'll see it's a combination of muscle strengthening and aerobic activities, um, including a warm up and a cool down period, um, also including some stretching. Uh, so this is important too, especially um, some of the strength training to help support the, you know, the muscles around the uterus, especially through the hips and the back, uh, to make sure that there's not, uh, and the glutes, of course, to make sure that there's not excessive strain on the low back as the uterus develops. So it doesn't have to be, you'll notice, there's one bout of vigorous intensity, but otherwise it's you know, moderate intensity and not super long duration either. Uh, Kathy, well, actually, let me go back here. There's a there's an end note here, which I think is important. So females with established pre-pregnancy routines should aim for higher duration of their activities. A person who rarely or never exercised prior to pregnancy should start with short durations of slow intensity activity and gradually build endurance. So basically, pregnancy isn't necessarily a time to start a new exercise routine. Um, if you, if a person is inactive going into pregnancy, well, I guess, yes, you would have to start an exercise routine, but it should be a very simple, low intensity, lower duration activities. But if a person is already pretty active prior to pregnancy, it's often recommended to just maintain that same amount of physical activity throughout the pregnancy. And then a word on caffeine. Um, so we do know that too much caffeine uh, can be harmful to the fetus. But I guess there's 
uh, in my view, I guess there's some mixed information out there, but it seems to be that under 200 megs of caffeine per day is safe. So that's about what you would get in one or two cups of coffee. Remember, a cup is eight ounces, so two cups would be 16 ounces. Um, yeah, so amounts above that may increase the risk for miscarriage and impair fetal development. Another, I think, important risk with caffeine intake is that caffeine can kind of be an appetite suppressant. So a person might take in caffeine and feel not hungry then, but that could potentially lead to not getting enough nutrients, not getting enough calories, and that obviously can be dangerous for fetal development. Um, and then another thing, depending on how a person may get their caffeine, you know, if it's a one of those big Starbucks drinks or, you know, a big drink from McDonald's or wherever, uh, that can be excessively, that those can be a lot of empty calories and potentially a lot of sugar, which can lead to excessive weight gain, gestational diabetes, large for gestational age, large for gestational age um, birth weight baby. So consider all of that as well with caffeine intake. Um, alcohol, we've said a little bit about this so far already, so it's certainly a known teratogen. Um, certainly the developing fetus, their liver cannot metabolize alcohol. Um, so ex, you know, alcohol intake during pregnancy can lead to fetal alcohol syndrome. We may also see spontaneous abortion um, complications during delivery, low birth weight, and greater risk for sudden infant death syndrome. So there's certainly no known safe level. Uh, so again, abstinence would be the best way to go. And that again begins prior to conception. And then tobacco again. So in you know a classic cigarette, um, you're going to be exposed to more than just the tobacco itself. So there could be other mineral exposures like lead, cadmium, cyanide, of course, nicotine, and carbon monoxide. Um, what we see with uh, tobacco exposure or exposure to any of these other toxins is reduced blood flow. And so, of course, that's going to reduce nutrient delivery to the fetus, and that can result in many different types of complications, certainly growth retardation, um, low birth weight baby preterm, can certainly lead to miscarriage and stillbirth, and it can lead to abnormalities in the placental development as well, or placental functioning. So of course, exposure to tobacco is going to put an infant at a higher rate for sudden infant death syndrome, neonatal mortality, so shortly after birth having uh, death, uh, respiratory illnesses, as well as allergies. And then other illegal drugs. So again, some of this may be not even illegal drugs, but some prescription medications, over-the-counter drugs and supplements. So all of these things can go through the placenta. They can accumulate in the fetal organs and tissues, and they can cause lots of different problems. Again, they may reduce blood flow, um, and of course that's going to interfere with oxygen and nutrient delivery to the fetus. So a lot of the same things, we could see low birth weight, premature delivery, placental um, deficits in the placenta, so not being nutrient rich, miscarriage as well. Um, if, a port, if a fetus is exposed to any sort of um, drugs during pregnancy and then they're born uh, and develop into a child, they're going to be at a greater risk for developmental delays, so cognitive developmental delays, impaired learning, as well as behavioral problems. So many effects on the brain. Again, there's no safe um, level for drug use during pregnancy. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. Now I'm going to stop this lecture here, and then we'll pick back up with um, lactation, breastfeeding, and, and basically this first year of life for the newborn uh, child. So that will be 17 part two. Okay, cool. Thanks for listening so far. We'll see you in part two.